If you enjoy content like this, please take a moment to like and subscribe, watch it, and then join the conversation at avnirvana.com. All right. So this is going to be a basic uh, Room EQ Wizard demonstration. I'm calling it the best free tweak you will ever buy. Um, so when I did this at Exponent, they didn't know what Roo was necessarily, so they wouldn't know. You guys obviously know what Roo is. You will know that it's free, but you also probably recognize that it's a pretty cool tool that we have free access to. So uh, I, I just want to quickly mention my affiliation so that you know where I'm coming from. Uh, so I am from AV Nirvana, which is another forum like uh, AVS from the Home Theater Shack guys. And uh, they also are hosting now Room EQ Wizard. And so uh, that's kind of my role with that. If you go to our website, you'll see our reviews. I write some of them. So please read them. <laughs> uh, so I already mentioned that Room EQ Wizard is uh, which we call Roo is basically being hosted on this site. It's sort of the official support site at AV Nirvana. John Mulcahy, who's the developer of it, provides free support there. It's really the only site where he's routinely providing this level of support. So it's great because he wrote the software. You got a question, he's got the right answer. Me, on the other hand, I don't know what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> here are its free features. Well, here is like a really small sampling of its features. And I know you can't read that, which is sort of the point. This software is extremely capable. So what I'm going to show you today is really dealing mostly with how to take basic amplitude response measurements, the frequency response, but it's capable of quite a bit more. Um, so you can use it for doing, like you guys have seen those CEA 2010 uh, subwoofer tests that, that like James Larson is here does and others. Uh, so this software actually has like a built-in ability to do that. It's got a full uh, tone generator that you can use for testing all sorts of things. Uh, it's got the ability to take uh, impulse response measurements. It can do RTA measurements. Uh, it has uh, different kinds of spectrograms, uh, including wavelets, which is my new obsession. So <laughs> lots of cool things in there. So tools of the trade, things that you need to actually do this. So we'll start with that. You need to have a measurement microphone. And I, I think for home theater guys, you guys have had this beaten into your head that you need to use a measurement microphone. I actually get a lot of people who come more from like the studio world, and they'll be sticking their standard studio microphone in a stand and measuring and saying, hey, how come my response looks so bad? So besides the fact that most speakers don't actually look very flattering in a frequency response measurement, uh, you do need to make sure you're using a microphone with a flat frequency response. So the nice thing is that the wonderful people at Mini DSP and at Dayton uh, Parts Express have uh, produced very inexpensive, under $100 microphones that are have a very flat response. And when you use the correction files that they provide, they are basically uh, close enough to a reference microphone for our purposes. And uh, they plug in through USB, which is really, really easy then. And then what you can do is you take your laptop or whatever computer you're using, if it has an HDMI connector like this one does and you're doing like a home theater where you've got an HDMI input, you run a nice long HDMI cable like I have over to the receiver. You plug in your USB cable and you put it in a micro, uh, microphone stand. I actually intentionally brought my cheapest one I had. This is an Amazon Basics. I think it was like $15, something like that. It's really cheap. So you don't have to spend a lot of money to do this and you don't need a lot of fancy cables. Roo is then going to send test tones through your receiver through that HDMI connection the same way it would for music or if you were watching a movie. So one thing that I think people sometimes don't fully understand is they think to themselves, all I care about is how my system sounds. I don't really care what it measures like. I'm not a scientist. I'm not interested in the physics here. So why, is Roo, why am I calling Roo a tweak? So it provides useful, repeatable, and objective information that can be used to optimize the setup of the system. So that's like the huge thing. Most of us, even really experienced audio engineers, let's say, don't necessarily have ears that are attuned well enough that they could sit down, listen to a system, and say, oh, for sure, there's a big boost at 50 hertz, there's a big cut at 80 hertz. And to be able to and then listen in different positions, for instance, and figure that all out. So it's hard for us with our ears alone to really recognize everything that's going on. And we'll hear it, but we'll have trouble really quantifying what we're hearing, and it takes time. With Roo, you can actually do this very quickly. And for those of you that don't have the experience of listening to lots of gray systems, it's actually even harder, since you don't have a point of reference, to know what you're listening for. The microphone, on the other hand, uh, is, is measuring against flat. 
So if it's not flat, then there's something wrong. And the trick for us is really figuring out, A, are we getting measurements that are in fact representative of what we hear, which we'll talk about a little bit. And then the second thing to think about is uh, how flat is flat enough. And, it, and the reality is it does not actually have to be that smooth to sound pretty good. Our ears are really good filters. So we've talked a lot about EQ business on the, the EQing systems on the forums, and you guys are familiar with this, and I think a lot of you are kind of wondering what this is all about. So you're literally modifying the signal before it goes into the system. You're essentially preconditioning it in order to compensate for the distortions that the room causes, and to some extent, the speakers themselves. So you're EQing it to make it sound better. And some people get confused by this because they think to themselves, why would I want to modify the signal? Somebody spent all this time engineering a perfectly good speaker and a perfectly good system. And the problem is, what people don't necessarily recognize is how bad the room itself actually is. Even really well-designed engineers, uh, really well-designed and engineered rooms, I mean, uh, have problems and they cause huge distortions, huge linear distortions in the system. What that means is the frequency response gets to be really, really uh, wavy and, and it sounds poor. And so the EQ is one of the ways we can compensate for that. And to do that well, you really need to use measurements. So the basic steps, as I mentioned earlier, are you need this microphone, you need the laptop, you plug it into your system. That's your connection. You plug your mic into the computer. That's how it gets sound in, into it. And then you have to place the microphone at the first measurement position. So that should probably ideally be your main listening position where you typically listen. That's where I would recommend to start. Um, it's not really that critical. You can measure in any order you want, but make sure you label them. So you place your mic in the listening position. Now, I typically recommend that you place the microphone pointing up. So here's the thing I'm going to say about that. If you have a microphone that came from cross-spectrum, where they've given you a 0, a 45 degree, and a 90 degree compensation, pointing up with the 90 degree compensation is probably the best thing to do. If you have one of these and you don't have that correction, for low frequencies only, it's probably fine. But to be honest, you should otherwise be pointing it at the speakers because the response won't be accurate pointing up. If you have one of the mini DSPs, they have a 90 degree correction. It isn't actually a measured 90 degree correction, it was derived. And so some people believe you shouldn't point it up, you should point it at the speakers and use the zero degree correction. Some people say point it up. At low frequencies, it doesn't matter, and that's really where you should be focused anyway. So I'm just gonna say, I think you should point it up. Since you're gonna be measuring all the speakers, it means that the microphone's response shape is gonna be roughly the same for each speaker. It's gonna get the most information from the room, and it's just the easiest way to do it even if you don't have the proper 90 degree curve. So you place your mic in that position and you're gonna take a measurement, we'll go through that a little bit, and you keep repeating these steps in each position. So if this was my room and I was doing it, this might be my main listening position where you're sitting. I'd probably place my mic there, I'd probably put the stand behind your head, and I'd put the mic so that the stand actually goes down over the seat with the mic pointing up, and I would take a measurement there. My next measurement position might be over where you're sitting. My next measurement position might be over where you're sitting. Then I might go to the back seats. Now I'll say this, Mike's room is set up relatively well so that none of the seats are overly close to a wall. What I wouldn't do is, let's say Mike actually had four seats here and five seats there and they actually pushed right up against the wall. I wouldn't bother measuring those end seats against the wall because those measurements are likely going to be fairly poor uh, from the reflections off the wall. And I don't want to compensate for that because whoever gets those crappy seats gets crappy seats. And I don't want to make my seat worse <laughs> because of their crappy seats, right? So you, there's certain, you have to look at your room. If you've got like a nice space like this, you measure basically in all the seats. And I mentioned that I would do what would uh, total probably seven measurements. I actually would do more than that. I would take more measurements around the main listening position. I would just move it a little bit over to one side, a little bit over to the other side, a little bit up, a little bit down. And the reason you do that is you just want to see how the response changes. Again, we're going to talk about this. That's part of the analyzing the data. So we've talked about the connection process. Using the HDMI, you can get the full 7.1. You can send discrete to each of your channels like that. You can also actually do it through the analog sound. I've actually, on my computer, done it through the headphone output before. I've done it through a sound card, a sound interface. So there's lots of ways this can be done. And even if you have a surround system and you want to go to each speaker, if your surround processor has uh, like a 5.1 input of some kind, you can do it through that. That's, so that's something I've done before. It works fine. Um, ideally, you want to use the signal path that you're listening through just because sometimes the receiver or your source somehow modifies the signal and you want to make sure you're capturing that. 
So as I mentioned, place the mic at this uh, the primary listening position. I said, uh, face it up. You wanna make sure you've loaded the correction file for it. At low frequencies, it's not a huge deal, but one of the nice things is that the correction file does help to ensure that it's basically flat to 20 hertz. And if you have the cross spectrum one, it actually makes sure it's flat to below 20 hertz. Um, as I said, uh, the mic corrections are not all that big a deal below 500 hertz. These capsules are actually pretty flat. They get a little bit rough by actually closer to like five kilohertz, and that's where you start to have corrections. Um, so what I'm saying is in a room, I'm using this 500 hertz to actually mean something. It's not 500 hertz like generically. It's that 500 hertz is above the room's, what's called the Schroeder frequency, the, res the FS of the room but it's still within what we call the transition zone. So the, in, a, in a room, there's sort of these acoustic zones, if you will. And at higher frequencies, there's what's called a statistical zone. And what that means is that statistically, you can figure out where the sound is coming from. But when you take a measurement, you could retake that exact same measurement and get a slightly different result in the high frequencies because the way in which the sound is reflecting off of the walls and coming from the speakers varies a little bit, uh, even over time. At low frequencies, that isn't as true. And the room actually starts to play a bigger and bigger role in the sound. And so you get into a, a, what's called a modal zone. And instead what you tend to see is that the response stays the same except that these modes cause the response to get big dips and peaks. And people, you guys have heard about the modes. That's what we're trying to actually typically fix. There's then a transition zone between that modal zone and that stochastic or statistical zone that is an area where depending on what's going on and what it looks like, it is okay to maybe apply a little EQ moving the subs around a little bit might actually have an effect up maybe not to 500 hertz but it could have an effect even up to like 200 hertz and so this is a zone where you're still playing around and so 500 hertz and below is a place where we care about and it happens to also be a place where most microphones all measure about the same your uh as long as there's no filters on it even your own smartphones microphones can pick up sound pretty flat down to that so um, the other thing I mentioned here is you might want to take a picture. When you do this, you're going to need to repeat the same measurement points when you apply EQ so that you can see if what you did worked the way you expected it to. And so it's, I'm not going to say if you're off by an inch, it's going to make a huge difference. But it does change. Small changes in the mic's position can change the response. And if for some odd reason, that's why I was saying like I usually take a bunch of measurements around my main listening position. Sometimes you'll get like a weird reflection off the ceiling or something with the mic, you'll, or you'll just happen to hit some weird uh, resonant zone where you get a big cancellation in the response and you move it a little bit and it goes away. So you wanna make sure that when you find that good spot that you're able to repeat that same good spot and you don't accidentally do all this EQ and then measure in the bad spot and you're like, oh no, what did I do? When in fact all you did was put the mic in the wrong spot. So what I sometimes do is I'll put the mic in the spot and I'll take a picture and I'll go to the side and I'll take another picture and then that way I can use the picture to get you know close enough. The other thing you could do is maybe put like a sticker or I know somebody who actually, he puts a push pin in the ceiling and hangs a string down. I don't like to put holes in my ceiling, but you know if you don't care, you can do that. So here we've got uh, we're just going to go through the basic steps here. So in the upper left corner that, okay, I apologize, you cannot see, but over here would be something that says measure. You'd click on it and this would come open. So um, when this uh, comes up, what you want to do is you're going to measure the, you're going to set your frequency response you want to measure to. So uh, I'm in here, I'm doing 20 hertz. I know a lot of you guys have bass below 20 hertz or you would like to find out if you have bass <coughs> below 20 hertz, you can do that. Keep in mind, anything probably below 30 hertz potentially could start doing damage to your system. So if you really think you've got bass below 20 hertz and you want to do it, A, I would make sure it's not up too loud until you have a sense of what your distortion curve looks like. And B, I would make sure you know your system can do that. If you built your own subs and they're ported, for instance, and you ported them at 20 hertz, 10 hertz could cause the woofer to exceed its X-max so significantly to damage it. So I typically, because for acoustic purposes, below 20 hertz serves no purpose. So I typically set it at 20 hertz. I go up to 22,000 hertz and I always do, for the, unless I'm in a hurry, I always do full frequency response measurements and I'll describe why later. But even if you don't need that data for things like EQing, having it helps because for instance, the harmonics of distortion are at multiples of the, of the fundamental, right? So a second harmonic of 100 hertz is 200 hertz. But what if we're looking at the ninth harmonic, for instance, which is at near, it's 900 hertz. So I like to do full measurements so that I don't get rid of any of that. And it helps me too, because sometimes I can look at other things like distortion to make sure that the system isn't distorting oddly in some way that I didn't expect. Uh, okay, so the, here, the, the uh, 128K and it says length, that's the FFT length. 
So the way that this system works is it uses a way of processing the signal and, the and it's called FFT or Fast Fourier Transform. The longer that you make that, the lower the noise floor. And that's good for things like distortion or any of the decay measurements like waterfall plots or the wavelets. For most of you, 128K is probably fine. Uh, if you have a noisy room with like a lot of constant noise, go to 256K. If you really want like the best measurement and you don't care about the added length of time it takes to take the measurement, you can go to one, one uh, meg and that's fine. Um, <clears throat> in terms of output, you'll see that I picked the left and I'm using an acoustic reference. I'm also using the left for that, that's fine. Um, when I, you know, I might do all the measurements I told you about like that. The way I have my <coughs> system set up, that would actually cause the subwoofer to come on and the left speaker, which is a good way to do it because you can see how they integrate while you're playing around with the EQ and everything. I might do it with the right speaker next. I might then do it with the center channel. If you use the ASIO drivers, you can hit them each discreetly as well. That's fine. It's not all that important, but I would say this. You do want to make sure that when you're measuring and tuning a system, you don't rely on a measurement of just the subwoofer and just the mains, because that doesn't actually tell you how they integrate. So you do want to make sure that you do at least, like I would actually do all of your EQ measurements based on like the left speaker and the subs playing. Uh, so you hit start, and it's going to do its thing. I have here, shh. So the way this system works, a little bit of talking and noise isn't going to totally corrupt the measurements. And I used to be really lax about this, but I've actually gotten some measurements from people where I saw really odd distortion results and some kind of weird dips in the response. And I took the file, the WAV file, out of Roo, and I stuck it in a program called Audacity, which is just like a sound recording program. And I listened, and I could hear people talking loudly. <laughs> and it turned out that the weirdness in the response was background noise. So it's pretty good. It, 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 dealing with that. But you need to be quiet. And, you know, my recommendation is try to find a quiet time to do it. All right, so as I mentioned, it's pretty important to take multiple measurements. And this actually came up on a forum recently where somebody had brought up whether microphones measure like our ears. So I'm just going to really briefly talk about this idea here. Measurements don't measure like our ears. They don't hear what we hear. And while in some ways, like the resolution, the frequency resolution that they can capture is better than our ears, what matters ultimately is how it sounds to us. So it doesn't matter that this, for instance, can measure in a more flat way or have greater resolution than our ears because it's what our ears hear that counts. And there's a problem. Our ears don't have the same kind of uh, polar pattern, the way they pick up frequencies at different angles as one of these do. So these are actually picking up sound in a room differently than we hear it. So if all you do is stick the mic in that position and take one measurement, you have not captured what you hear and I hear people sometimes say, oh, no, but I don't move my head, so why do I need to measure more than one position? doesn't matter. That microphone didn't pick up what you hear, even in that one position. So you do got to take more. And so that's what this idea of getting some spatial variance is. You want to actually cover a few different spaces in where your head would be to get a sense. And you're going to find that for the most part, in most rooms at low frequencies, the response doesn't change much if you're only moving it 6, six to 12 inches. But you still got to take those measurements. They're pretty important. So the next thing you're going to do is once you've collected all this information, you've got to analyze the data. So what I do is I take my measurements. I label them pretty carefully as to where I took them. So like I said, I usually, for the purposes of acoustics, so I will check all the speakers because I want to see that they all look right and everything's OK. But for acoustics purposes, tuning the system, I don't use all the different speakers. I use usually just the left or the right speaker and the subs playing at the same time, and that's it. And I do all my analysis based on all the different space in the room from that. And what I look for is how it varies. So what I would expect is that it will vary, if I have just a single subwoofer, it will vary quite a bit in a room this size and all those different seats. The modes are just going to cause that to happen. But I would not expect it to vary all that much around my head. And I want to see that. And if it does, I want to see how and why. And I want to look for big peaks and big dips. So if I take a measurement of this system and I see that there are some really big peaks and dips, the first thing I'm going to do as part of my analysis process is try to figure out the cause of that. So if I didn't move the speakers and I took the measurements like I mentioned to you, then that gives me a sense of how the response changes from the room modes, which is the sound, the low frequencies hitting the walls and interfering with the direct sound that you're getting in your position. But there's another thing called SBIR, which is uh, speaker boundary interference response, which is what happens when the speaker's sound radiates, for instance, behind the speaker. And at low frequencies, it does up, down, that way and back and interferes with the direct sound coming directly from the speaker. 
So in one case, it's an interference from where you're sitting. The other one is an interference from where the speaker is. So I need to figure out which of those it is. Because if it's a room mode, there's not a lot I can do about that. Multiple subwoofers can help. Uh, some treatment of the room to a point can help. EQing some of the peaks can help. But if it's speaker boundary interference, moving the speakers can actually make a difference. So I want to know that so that I know what I need to treat. I check distortion. I don't make a big deal about it. Like to me, if you get into this sort of what I call like desktop drag racing, where you're like, oh, my system has 0.01% versus your 0.1%, that's silly. That's, it's like totally meaningless. All you're looking for is does the distortion curve remain relatively smooth and flat at the, the I mean, you should be measuring at like 80, I didn't say this earlier, but around 80 to 85 decibels is a good level to measure at. So at that point, you shouldn't see any big rise in distortion. Maybe at low frequencies, as you get closer to the lower limit of your system, you're going to see the distortion rise, and that's OK. But over most of its range, you want to see that it remains low and, and flat. And as long as it's below 1%, it's probably fine. If it has a couple peaks that get up above 2 3%, that's probably fine too. What I look for is sometimes you'll see like a sudden rise, especially if the speaker has a damaged tweeter, basically starting with the tweeter starts. That whole area will rise up pretty high, and it'll actually probably exceed 5%, 10%, maybe higher yet if it's really damaged. I also sometimes have found some speakers that just weren't that well designed. And the crossover caused the tweeter to overload at 85 decibels. And I saw that in the measurement, where as soon as the tweeter came in, there was a big rise in the distortion, and then it went down again. So I want to know that, because that tells me what the system is like and how it's working. In that particular case, you can't fix that, but I still would want to know it. RT60 refers to the way that sound reverberates and decays in the room. So I look at it, but I want to warn you guys. I look at them, I think most people look at them, and most experts, even though they look at them, will tell you they're not very valid. It's repeatable. So from that standpoint, I consider it valid. But these rooms are acoustically way too small for the concepts that underlie RT60 to be accurate. So I tend to look at what's called EDT, early decay time. Um, and uh, there's one, I forget what it stands for, but it's TOPT. Those are the only two I really look at, and I, I would take it a little bit with a grain of salt. Your goal is you want to see that it's under half a second, 500 milliseconds. Um, ideally, if it's a home theater, it should actually be like under 300 milliseconds. And you want it to be as flat and smooth as possible. So this is not something you can EQ. This is something you have to treat with acoustic treatments like this. So if you see that, like for instance, it's really wavy and bumpy, that tells you how to treat the room. Now, at low frequencies, it's not valid. So below 100 hertz, it pretty quickly becomes invalid. And you're not going to use them for that purpose. But ideally, if you've treated the room well enough, you do actually see that they stay flat down you know, potentially to like 50 to 80 hertz. Um, I resist the waterfall. So how many of you, raise your hand, have read professionals even tell you that when setting up a system, you need to look at waterfall plots? Yeah, lots of you. So here's the problem with that, and here's why I say resist the waterfall. These systems operate generally at what's called steady state. A steady state system operates in a particular way that's really important. Whatever happens at one point in time is carried out over time. So if there's a peak in the response at time 0, there is a peak in response at time 30. And so that means that th what they're telling you to do is look for ringing, right? They're telling you that there's ringing and you need to get rid of it. Well. There will only ever be ringing in a system if there's a peak in the steady state response at time zero. So you don't need to look at the waterfall. You know what's happening over time based on what's happening at time zero. So that's why I say resist it, because the problem is there, it's not a very good resolution. It's telling you nothing different than what the steady state told you, and it can give you misleading information. You'll think you have ringing when, in fact, all you have is some noise in the background that it picked up. Or you'll think you don't have ringing when, in fact, you do that's in the steady state response, but the resolution of the waterfall is too poor to pick it up. So if you really want to look at what's happening over time, A, a trained eye, and it doesn't take a lot of training, can pick it up from the steady state. And B, there's a better thing called a wavelet that you should use. So check the wavelet instead. And then one third octave filtered impulse response. So one of the things you can do, this is for somebody who was asking about more advanced. This is probably more advanced. If you go into the impulse response, there's a filtered, in in filtered impulse response, and you can set frequencies. If you look at the different ones, you'll see what you'll get a sense of like what it should look like, which is basically a nice kind of round looking impulse. As it gets to be higher frequency, it's going to go more from like a almost ball shape to something more pointy until it gets to be really thin and pointy. Again, we're only focused on like 500 hertz and below. Everything above that, these measurements are not really a great way of assessing acoustics. So what I do is I look at 500 hertz or so and below, and I look at the shape. 
And what you're going to find in a room is that where you should have, like 250 hertz is a really common one. 250 hertz happens to be the point where ceiling and floor bounce, that's a kind of SBIR, causes a certain cancellation. And what you see then is this, instead of seeing like one nice round impulse, you actually see a doublet, two of them together, and they're misshapened. It's the cancellation. So you can look at those, and it's a really nice way of assessing the improvements you've made in your system as you move the speakers, you add treatments, things like that. It's much better than using the waterfalls or the uh, even the steady state. So I mentioned Wavelet. Um, again, I don't know if James left or if he's around, but I, I put this in just to annoy him, because I've been <laughs> literally like, obsessed with this. <coughs> so this is a really good Wavelet. That's what a system looks like that has a really well integrated low frequencies in a room that measures fairly well. These are not on the same scale, I apologize. So that one ends at one kilohertz, this one ends at 20 kilohertz, but you can compare. So here's one kilohertz on this one and down, there's one kilohertz down on that one. You'll see this one doesn't come out past 10 milliseconds. This system is full range speakers, there's no subwoofer. This one has a subwoofer in it, look at that. Where the subwoofer comes in at 80 hertz, the time comes all the way out to 40 milliseconds and then it comes off like that. This system has too much delay coming in as a result of the subwoofer and it's causing poor integration and I picked it up in the wavelet. So I like these because to me that's so easy to see. I, there's nothing, I just look at that, I know that's wrong, I gotta fix it. All right, so filtered impulse responses. Here's a filtered impulse response from that speaker I mentioned that was full range, 250 hertz. That looks really good. This is actually what it should look like. This is 250 hertz taken on a speaker outside, so there's no reflections affecting this one. So see what I was saying? Actually kind of looks like a radish, I guess, instead of a ball, but you get the point. This is a little misshapen, pretty good. That's what, I bet yours are gonna look like this. I think th this didn't come out of my room, this came out of that one, but I, my room doesn't look that much better than this. This is what happens when a room that has this floor and ceiling reflection kind of gets its way. And you'll see there's kind of two in there. It's a little bit misshapen in the in-between area. You'll see that like here, you'll see it should actually just completely turn into nothing. Here it's actually pretty large. It even starts to enlarge again here. That's why I like these. It's pretty easy to see the effect. And if you want to show somebody or even show yourself the effects of your treatment, this is an easier way to visualize it. Now when you set that one third octave filter, does that at what hertz? This is 250. But you oh, can pick different. Okay. Yeah, you can pick different ones. The reason I picked 250 for this so example. This is just specifically then around that frequency yeah. that you're talking about. Okay. But it's telling me that there's something at that frequency that's wrong acoustically in the room. So you actually have to go through and look at each yeah, one. Yeah, you gotta look at every way. one. Okay. Yep. Yeah. We're not doing that right now because we'd be here all day. Uh, if I do this for myself or a client, like I can easily spend eight hours. I mean, I might spend two hours taking measurements and another four to six hours analyzing it. Okay, so we're gonna look at a case study. Now, I know you guys probably wanted to see the subwoofer thing. I did a separate presentation for the subwoofer integration. Um, it's easier for the purposes of illustrating these concepts if we just stick with a bookshelf speaker and go through. So here is a case study. So I was sent these Dayton Audio MK402s for review. I stuck them on some stands in my office, uh, something kind of like that. They were probably about six feet apart, six and a half feet from me. It's an office system. I was, you know, this isn't how yours would be, but the concept remains the same, scale it up, right? And that's what the response looked like when I measured it. So this is the kind of notorious Dayton Audio MK402 high frequency lift, but here's what I was talking about before. I mean, there's actually bass you can see, like pretty solid out to 40 hertz here. Um, 50 hertz is the point where it's roughly equal with all of this, but there's a big dip right there at around 80 hertz, and there's some noise over there, and peaks and dips, and it doesn't look good at all. So we took the speaker outside, and we measured it outside. This is what speaker characterization looks like. This is across the frontal plane of the speaker only, the horizontal plane, and you can see that the response has that upward tilt I was talking about, but interestingly enough, it's pretty even. Like, even though the response isn't flat, or smooth, it doesn't change a lot with angle, and that's good. And we see in the polar pattern that that remains true as well. That's what that's a polar map. Um, so it's not bad. It's, that means it's a cueable. I can do something with this. So I took this. I looked at it. Uh, this is a different piece of software than Rue, but I took measurements with Rue to do this. Um, and I decided that well, first I need to maybe tackle that low frequency problem. So I looked at just that portion of the response and looked at these 
dips, these peaks, and decided what I wanted to do to EQ them. So Rue has an ability to automatically generate EQ for you. There's nothing wrong with that. I would just say, go ahead. If you've never done a lot of EQing, go ahead and use that. I actually don't use it a lot for low frequencies only because it helps keep me from doing what I think Rue can do to a lot of systems. And that is, if not done correctly, and, the, and with the system not set up correctly, Rue could potentially apply like 20 EQ filters. It would just go to town. And the system will look really flat in Rue. But it's going to add potentially a lot of group delay. It can actually make those, if you look at those impulses, it can cause the way that they ring over time to actually not, they're supposed to decay out really quickly and they won't. It's ringing actually. Um, and it doesn't actually sound very good. You'll do something and you'll, you'll get it all set up and you'll measure it and it looks good and you'll sit in your primary listening position and you're like, this doesn't sound, it sounds like the bass is gone. And, it's, and then people will tell you, oh, it's because you didn't put in a house curve. It can actually be because you basically overprocess the signal. So if you can learn to eyeball these so that you can say that, oh, yeah, it looks like it's about 48 hertz and uh, the Q looks like it's something like around 2, you can actually avoid that tendency and you get it flat enough. I mean, our resolution of our ears below 100 hertz is not even as good as one third octave, so you don't need to be that precise. But because I know you guys are going to do this, and I certainly do it sometimes too. I did go ahead and let Rue auto-calculate some. So here you can see how I did that. I set a response curve for that speaker and applied the EQ. And uh, this was the response after everything was done. Now, the high frequencies are flattened out. I, I should be really careful. So you saw that I characterized the speaker ahead of time. I did not EQ anything above 500 hertz based on in-room measurements. When I applied EQ, in order to make that graph you saw, there were some manually applied EQs. That was because I, in that other piece of software, I generated the EQ filters that I wanted to use above 500 hertz in the system. And then I manually put those into Roo so that it wouldn't try to compensate for those when I did the uh, EQing of the low frequencies. And that's the same octave smoothing that, that was in the initial graph? Yeah. Uh, I think they should both be 112. I usually use 112. It's actually finer than your ears can hear at, at most low frequencies. So that's what that that's the power response of the system. That's what it looks like. So this was uh, this is not actually measurements. This is what it looked like based on simulation, but it's close enough. And so you can see that the response still remains relatively even, um, but now it's flatter, and that's nice. So here you can see a little animation that shows the difference in the low frequencies. This is the waterfall. Here's, and remember I told you, I don't like to use them, but I showed them for a reason because I know this is what everybody's used to seeing. So I'm showing it to show you how it affected the uh, ringing, but here's the thing about this. You can see that everywhere where there's big ridges, there also was a big peak in the response in the first place. So I didn't need to look at the waterfall to know there was going to be ringing or a ridge. I only needed to look at that steady state. And here are our filtered impulse responses. So notice what EQ did. Look at how much it knocked out the ringing that was going on. So in case anyone's ever told you or you've read that EQ has no effect on the dampening or ringing of a system, that is absolute proof that it does. Here they are overlaid. Again, look at the massive difference. That green is the old one and cutting out the ringing in the system. So um, the approach that I showed you here makes it look like EQ and measurements are the greatest thing ever and that everybody should go out and do that. But I need to tell you that there's some things that I kind of fudged here to make it look better because I was trying to make a point. That is that I really only, t I said I took one, but I took a couple of measurements, but I only did them in one listening position in an office system. If you do it in a theater like this, there's going to be too much variation to get that level of improvement. You could make that level of improvement for that seat but it wouldn't apply anywhere else. So that my other talk deals with a, a solution for that. Acoustic treatments and a multiple sub approach is only, the only way you can get rid of that variance. Um, so the EQing approach, unless you're using multiple spread out low frequency sources, is only going to be valid in one position. And you run the risk, it's a very real risk, of making it worse in the other positions. Um, it can make things worse generally. So if you've looked at some of Floyd Tool's writing, he actually did some writing for Audioholics that, that touches upon this. He mentions how uh, EQ that was being applied in the heyday before his multi-sub approach was developed and sound field management uh, tended to make things worse. 
so I was telling you earlier one of the ways that can happen. Just applying too much EQ to a system in the wrong way based on faulty measurements can make a system look better and actually sound worse. If you use a lot of boost, which people tend to do, uh, and you don't have to use, like you might say, oh, well, I made sure I only used three decibels of boost, but if you've got a bunch of filters that actually overlap each other and they all have boost, that compounds and that boost goes up. You can run the risk of overtaxing the amplifier. So remember, every three dB requires a doubling of amplifier output. So like, think about how much power mic system needs. Now imagine adding six or 10 or 20 decibels of boost at low frequencies. Now his system is extraordinarily efficient and he's got, I don't even know how much power over there. So it's not a huge issue for him, but for a lot of us, especially if you're using subs that don't have big giant separate amplifiers, you could be talking about taking your subs from its limit already to like so far beyond the limit that you're gonna destroy them. So you gotta be careful you don't do that. And then as I, I said 700 Hertz here, you can see there, there isn't an exact number, 500 Hertz, 700 Hertz. There's a certain point though where you just shouldn't be applying any more EQ. The 700 Hertz was because a company I was working with at the time had said that was their limit, so I was trying to be fair to them, but I myself actually tend to keep most of my EQing below 100 Hertz and just apply it just a little bit, uh, usually low Q, so broad filters above that point, and I apply nothing above five to 700 Hertz at all, unless, like I said, I fully characterize the speaker outside and based it on that polar response. So room treatment, as I mentioned, one of the problems is that EQ doesn't fix all of the pro uh, all of the things that you'll pick up in your measurements. And so when you're trying to look at the room and, and figure out what you're supposed to do with it, room treatment does need to be something that you would think about. So one of the things that people tend to kind of get wrong is they think that the room is really, really lively and echoey and they need to bring their RT60 down. The reality is that they do tend to have some flutter echo and problems, but most rooms, if you took all of these treatments out of Mike's room, and you measured this room, it would sound echoey, but the RT60 time would probably still average about 500 milliseconds. Most rooms of this size typically always measure in that range. I measured, my parents had this room that I thought for sure was gonna be like the perfect example of a domestic space with a really uh, like high decay time because it's all wood. The floors were wood, it's a timber house, so it's got these big wood beams. Uh, it's got tons of big glass windows, really tall ceilings, 500 milliseconds on the on the nose when I measured it. And that's because drywall is actually an absorber at low frequencies. Uh, leather seats are an absorber up to mid-range frequencies. Carpet is an absorber at high frequencies. And this room itself is not very big. So combine all that together and you're gonna see a relatively low decay time. So what you need is actually selective treatment in certain positions to primarily uh, get rid of some of that flutter echo. And you need a lot of low frequency absorption. So bass traps, and like I said, the walls actually are a base trap. So accounting for that or designing the wall to be a better base trap can be one of your techniques. So one of the things to keep in mind, why I use EQ and multiple subs is because short of like two foot thick, I said one foot or more, but like massively thick low frequency velocity absorbers, which would be, this is called a velocity absorber, like pink fluffy insulation that comes out from the wall this far. Without that on every wall, you're not gonna absorb low frequencies. These are not absorbing anything below about 200 Hertz. And so <clears throat> if you're trying to fix that, you really have to use other techniques. And I, I can just tell you, I have measured a ton of rooms. I have applied, I mean, some of you saw last year, or if you went to Expona there, the base trap that I built, this thing was 24 inches by 24 inches by 36 inches. At one point I had two of them that I was using in my tiny office that's like 10 by 12 feet and it made a very small difference in the measurements. So uh, adding a lot of base trapping really doesn't do as much as, as EQing and multiple subs do. So um, really you're focused on other things. I, I do consider them complementary though, and like I said, in my rooms I design uh, the walls to be base traps, I do add velocity base traps, and I often add pressure absorbers. So here's an example of the measurement before and after I did. So this is in my office. So here's what I gotta tell you about this, because I think this is impressive. Notice the Schroeder curve here, that's that black line, how that changed in angle. Notice the differences in the peaks and dips. Obviously the initial didn't change at all, but everything after that did. Well, I guess it is changing a little bit, but it's not changing a lot. <clears throat> here's what you gotta know about this. There were two treatments on the sidewalls, and there was one base absorber. That was all I did. And that was the significance of the difference in the measurement. So I know you're not seeing anything like a frequency response that you could think about and understand what that means, but remember that these are not affecting the steady state very much. 
they're primarily affecting only the stuff that happens over time, and that's what this is a measurement of. So you can see that it did have a pretty dramatic effect given that it was two small uh, wall absorbers and a small base trap. So here is an example comparing the R uh, EDT, sorry, the early decay time before and after treatment. So you can see it's lower. It's also mostly flatter. It isn't here, and to be honest, that's probably the effects of the, the, the treatments are fabric covered, and so they tend to be reflective, excuse me, at high frequencies. So um, as you can see, I used a free tool. I, m I did a lot, right, with that free tool. I took a speaker outside, I measured it. I came up with an EQ, uh, EQ curve that turned a $50 speaker into one that had a pretty listenable flat response. I figured out what kind of uh, acoustic treatments I needed and I applied them. I got rid of the effects of room mode so that the bass response was flat. And it really didn't cost me much of anything. The, the, the acoustic treatments were something I made from materials I bought at Menards. So you can see that this tool is really powerful. And you can do a lot with it to make a system sound better. So I call it a free tweak. Because even though the tool itself doesn't cost anything, the dramatic improvements you can make to your system are far greater than what is typically true of other uh, treatments. I mean, I know you guys make fun of this stuff, so you know where I'm coming from. But people spend big money on new cables, cable isolators, stands, amp stands, speaker stands, you name it. This makes a massive difference by comparison to those. Those probably don't even make any difference. <laughs> so let's <laughs> 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 I don't review cables, so. Uh, so the point is, this is a like this is a real tweak. This is something we should be paying a lot of attention on. This is something that's worth our energy, and it doesn't even cost that much. So uh, that's really the whole thing, and at this point.